Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against the flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened in the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of God. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and then take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times of the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may may declare it boldly as I ought to speak, so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother of the faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers, and love with faith, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ, with love incorruptible. Good morning. Uh, We are finishing up uh, in Ephesians this morning. And uh, next week we'll we'll start the the book of Ruth. Um, I'm very excited about that. That's my my favorite um, book in the the Bible. Um, but this morning we'll we'll finish up Paul's letter to uh, the church at Ephesus. And I was looking back over um, some of the sermons and some of the notes um, that we've gone through uh, this week and. We've already talked about how God has equipped us as a body for for ministry, and we had a, a sermon with that title, Equipped for Ministry, and uh, Paul talked about our spiritual gifts and uh, how we can serve one another, how we can spread the, the gospel uh, through the gifts that God has given us, and then he talks about the being filled with the Spirit and those different relationships that we find ourselves in and how to serve in those. And then uh, he ends his letter uh, by saying, be prepared for battle. And so Paul has given us these instructions, um, illustrations, examples for, for how to live as part of God's new humanity. Um, he says that we've been brought from darkness to, to light, from death to life, that we should be, uh, there are things that we should be putting off and things that we should be putting on um, and has told us, how, how we're to live in response to who Jesus is and, and what he has done for us as Christians, um, and that it, it should affect our, our thinking, our desires, our uh, motivations, um, the what and the what we do and the, the why we do. Um, it affects those relationships, how we interact with those around us, um, and that the church is supposed to be um, I hope you've seen over and over again the theme of, of this book has been that the church is supposed to be this point of apocalypsis, this a point of revelation to uh, the world around us, that we are really supposed to be lights in the darkness, as, as Jesus um, says. And, um, and he adds, by the way, um, you're, you're going to be doing this in enemy territory. Uh, you're going to be doing this while the enemy is, is trying to destroy you, trying to injure you, trying to, to, to get you down, to, to silence uh, you. And so as, as Christians, we operate behind enemy lines, so to speak. Um, and it's important to know who the, the real enemy is. Um, Paul says that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. So that means the enemy, and we need to hear this this morning, especially in light of the decision this week and, and how we have seen some Christians respond. And, and we, we've, I was talking to Scott a little bit about this, and 
Um, it, it's great to be happy about that decision, um, but we still need to speak the truth in love and grace and be gracious with people because the enemy is not other people. It's not. Paul says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And we've seen that. He's already talked about that. Yes, there are those who follow the prince of the power of the air. He talked about that in chapter 2, verse 1. Yes, many have given themselves over to sensuality, greed, and impurity. He's talked about that in 419. But he also reminds us that we were once those people. We were rebellious against God. We were in darkness and have been brought to light. We were held captive. We were isolated from God. We were without hope. We, we were just like those people. So they're not our enemy. The gospel has set us free. It's, it's redeemed us. It's delivered us from captivity. It's restored us. We, we have this new birth, not because anything that we've done to deserve it, but because we have received God's free gift of, of grace through faith. And basically, Paul is telling us that if you can see them, they aren't your enemy. They're captives. And that's how we have to see people outside of the Christian faith. Not as enemies, but those who are, are captive, those who are in darkness, who have been deceived. These are people who need hope, who need to be rescued and restored and realigned to God's design and His purpose for our lives. And it's, it's easy for us to forget that sometimes. It's easy to forget that when we see people promoting and, and celebrating ideas and lifestyles that uh, go against what God has said in His Word, against His design for us as humanity, against His purposes, against His law. It's easy to attack the person. It's easy to belittle them, to make fun of them, to be sarcastic, to be uh, passive-aggressive uh, against them. And sadly, we even see people mix humor in with that and say, well, you won't be celebrating this in hell, ha, ha, ha. Guys, please don't do that. If we took hell serious and we took separation from God, serious. It would not make us laugh that someone is going there. It would make us weep. It would cause us to pray for them. It would cause us to reach out to them and speak to them, to share the gospel with them, to try to bring light to the darkness. It's much harder in those moments that we see people going against God's word to be broken, to weep over the lie that they have believed to approach them with that truth and love and in gentleness, engage respectfully. Not attack them, but attack the ideas. Our real enemy is the unseen influencer who is behind these ideas that is out to deceive and destroy. And so we need to know our enemy. He is known as the devil. And just to give you some, some background behind these words, um, the devil is the Greek word diabolos because he is the slanderer who defames God's character. He is known as the Satan. I know that sounds strange to our ears because we always say Satan as, as like that's his name, um, but it's actually the Satan. Uh, it's ha satanus. In Greek, and so it's the adversary. That's what Satan means. It comes from the Greek word satanus. Um, and so he is the adversary who opposes God's plan. The Bible calls him Beelzebub, which means the, the Lord of the flies or the, the Lord of, of dung. Um, and it's the idea of uh, being Lord of, of futility, of being Lord of waste and, and meaninglessness. He is known as the ruler of, of this world and age, reminding us that he is an active influence here and now, um, an influence that one day will end. He is known as the evil one who is characterized by wickedness, wickedness and an intent to harm. 
He's known as the father of lies that stands opposed to God's truth about life, about where we can find joy and security and comfort and happiness and those things that we're longing for. He's known as the serpent who was present to tempt and entice Adam and Eve in the garden. And he's known as the, the dragon, the rebel who was thrown out of heaven and who will one day be thrown into the lake of fire. When we read who our enemy is and, and see his names, we, we get an idea for his, his tactics. The devil is not the medieval idea of a guy in a red suit with horns and a, a pitchfork. Um, he's not always obvious. He's not always apparent. He's not like he's, he's glowing and you would immediately recognize him. He appears in camouflage. He is elusive. He attempts to pass the counterfeit off as truth. There are two things that the devil knows. And those two things are God's word and your weakness and my weakness. The devil knows God's word. He he knows God's design and purpose for us. He knows God's character and who he is and he hates him. And so his strategy is to get us to question God and who God is. And we see that even from the opening pages of the Bible in Genesis when we look at the Garden of Eden and Satan says, did God really say? Did God really mean what he said? Right now, in, in these circumstances, in, in this situation, don't you think there can be an exception? Don't you think that you can get away with this? Doesn't it seem like God is trying to hold back something from you? Doesn't it seem like he's trying to keep something for himself and, and not share that with you? Does he really love you? Has he really provided everything that you need? He tries to get us to question God. Even when tempting Jesus, he's quoting scripture to Jesus when he is in the wilderness trying to justify sin. He knows the word and he will manipulate it. and He will twist it. He knows the truth and he denies it and offers up an attractive counterfeit. And we need to be aware of that, especially in this day. Not only do we need to guard our own hearts and minds, but parents, we have a responsibility from God to shepherd our, our children. It's a great responsibility. It's a privilege, but it's also a great responsibility because, because there is this counterfeit message that exists. We, we need to be aware of where it's being proclaimed, what platforms it's on, how our children are exposed. We need to be on guard of those who, are, who have bought Satan's lie hook, line, and sinker, and they're propagating it. They're captives who are serving in their captivity, and in that deception, they're, they're propagating the devil's lies further. They're, they're blind gods. We need to be aware of that and we need to guard our, our children from that. Over and over the Bible warns us, do not be deceived. Don't be deceived just because someone holds the title of pastor or reverend. Weigh their words against Scripture. Make sure and test their words. Make sure they're lining up with Scripture and it's not just an opinion and I hope you do that with me. I, I really do. I hope you test what I say up here every Sunday morning against Scripture to see if I line up with Scripture. Don't be deceived that Christians should be progressing. That there are parts of the Bible that we just need to ignore because they're, they're outdated or irre irrelevant. God is not calling us to search for our truth He's calling us to follow His, to be subject to His Word 
and His authority and His design for our lives. The Bible warns us not to be deceived by those who would call evil good and good evil. The devil not only knows God's Word, but he also knows your weakness. He knows my weakness. Tony Evans says this, Like an opposing football team, his demonic realm watches your game film. They know your history, your weak spots, and your sin patterns. Their goal is to keep you from experiencing God's will for your life. You're not their first assignment. They're good at what they do. So often when we mess up, we try to pull Flip Wilson. Some of you that are younger may not know Flip Wilson. Um, in all actuality, he was before my time, but since I like to look up where phrases and things come from, um, the common phrase he said was, the devil made me do it. And so often when we sin against God, that's, that's what we say. Hey, the, the devil made me do it. I, I, it really wasn't me. No, he didn't make you do it. He might have tempted you, but the, the choice was yours to make. And see, the problem is that the truth is he couldn't tempt you if it wasn't something that you already didn't really want. And we need to let that settle this morning. Satan can never tempt you with something you don't already want. It's kind of like this. I, I, I hate white chocolate. I can't stand it. I don't know if it was one of those foods that I ate it when I was younger and I got sick, and now it just I, I just don't like it, but I, I can't stand the stuff. Um, at Christmas time, uh, Amanda will make those, uh, what is it, the little pretzels, that, and you're dipping them in white chocolate and putting the peppermints and, and different things on it. And I'm like, could you please make some, some milk chocolate ones? That's, that's up my alley. You, you will never, she could never make a dessert that was white chocolate and if i'm on a diet and all she made was white chocolate foods i'd probably lose some weight right because you're, you're not going to tempt me with that i can't stand it I, I don't i don't want that now if you put milk chocolate out there then then it's harder then it's harder and, and we need to think about that because this is this is how satan works in our lives this is what this spiritual battle is Eve saw the fruit, right? And she said, it's, it's pleasing to the eyes. It, it's, it looks like it would be good for food. And Satan pulls the, the carrot out and, and puts it in front of us to lead us where he wants to, to take us far, farther away from God and eventually off the, the cliff to our destruction. That, that's his tactic, guys. That, that's what he does. He dangles the carrot out so we'll follow it. And that's why we're told to, to kill our sin. Not, not to manage it. It's not something we can, can tame and, and control. We, we need to be killing it. John Owen said, be killing sin or it will be killing you. Our minds need to be renewed. Our thinking needs to be renewed. And I, I know you guys probably get tired of hearing me say this. Uh, our thoughts, our desires, our emotions, our, our actions. But guys, that's, that's how it works. And so our, our thoughts, our desires... Our emotions, those, those all need to be changed. And they can be changed. That's the good news. They can be. As we expose ourselves to God's Word and receive His wisdom and instruction and truth for our lives and see His greatness, He can change our lives. We're part of God's new humanity and part of God's kingdom. And, and the devil wants it to fail. He wants us to fall. And so he, he sets siege against the kingdom. And so there are, are waves of attacks that we will face uh, sometimes daily. It might be weekly. It could be uh, less frequently. But he sets siege against the castle. And, and so he may hurl massive rocks from a, a catapult. He may shoot a, a volley of arrows at us. He, he may bring a battering ram and, and try to ram the gates down. But whatever his tactic, his goal is always devastation. And destruction. Many of the problems in our lives are a direct result of this kind of spiritual warfare. Anger, anxiety, addiction, depression, divorce, debt, doubt, fear, pain, heartache, suffering. So many issues in our lives are a result of our 
adversaries, advancements for our souls, for our minds, for our affections. Guys, some days when we, we've had those days, you, you've had those days where it just feels like somebody's out to get me. And what Paul is saying here is sometimes somebody's out to get you. And it's the enemy. It's the adversary. And so we need to be on guard. We need to know who our enemy is. The good news is God has equipped us so we can withstand his assaults. Paul says that we should stand, that we can stand. And the word stand there is this idea of, of resistance and perseverance and endurance through those attacks that we will hold our ground. And it's important to remember as Christians, um, we're not fighting for victory, but we're fighting from victory, right? Right? Jesus has, has already won the war um, through His death and resurrection. He's already defeated sin, death, and hell. We may have doubts. We may get injured. We may pick up some bruises and scrapes. But if we always rally around Jesus, guys, we can't be defeated. Our victory is, is sure. And Paul is telling us to, to endure, to stand. And I was thinking about this, and you know, we often talk about how bad the world is getting and we can see uh, the enemy's influence and deception in the world around us. And it may come to a, a time in our lives where all around us is scorched earth. But guys, we can stand. And that's what Paul is saying. It, it may get really bad. The world may be falling apart and unraveling around us, but if we know Christ, we can endure that through Him what we are withstanding and enduring, Paul says, are, are Satan's schemes, the devil's schemes. We've already seen how his name reveals his tactics. And these schemes are that he tries to get us to question the goodness of God as a slanderer, that he tries to get us to disregard God's purpose and design as an adversary, that he tries to get us to, to doubt our salvation as an accuser, that He tries to tempt us, manipulate us, and sway us as the father of lies. And I think that is why Paul mentions first in this suit of armor, the belt of truth. Um, the belt of truth is, is God's Word, and His truth is our foundation. Everything depends on the reliability of God's Word. And even... Paul is honest about that when he's writing letters and says, you know, if, if, if Christianity is not true, if all of this was just made up, then Christians are to be pitied most among all people. But if it's true, and I'm convinced that it is, guys, we should be some of the most content, some of the most happy, some of the most peaceful people that you can, can find anywhere. It should make a difference in our lives. Paul talks about this belt of truth, and in those days, um, you know, they didn't have shorts and, and shirts and, and pants and, and those kind of things. Everyone wore longer tunics. Um, I, I think I guess the, the best way I can think of this is if you, this is totally different, but if you think of uh, a Christmas carol and, and like the tunic that Ebenezer Scrooge wore as he's walking around with his light or something you know it almost looks like um, a night shirt or pajamas or, or something but they would wear these tunics and in order to hold the fabric in place as you were walking around or if you was, were a, uh, a soldier and you were marching or in battle and you're fighting and, and you don't want things to, to get wrapped up and, and it's cumbersome and you're trying to unwrap your sword you know, from your tunic or you, you're getting twisted in it while you're running, fall down. You, you wore a belt. And the belt did a, a lot more for the soldier um, than just hold their tunic together. Everything was attached to this belt. The, the sword would be 
uh, attached to the belt. A dagger would be attached to the belt when, when we get to the, the breastplate. Um, actually, the breastplate or the chain mail, whatever that would be, would be fastened to this belt to, to hold it in place so it's not moving around while you're in battle. So it holds everything together. And Paul talks about this belt of truth served almost as a uh, utility belt. It, it was important. And, and I guess the idea that I can share to, to kind of bring that into today's um, mindset is think about Batman. Right? Okay? So, I remember watching Batman when I was younger, and, and the belt is what made Batman, right? W- without the belt, um, he, he's just a normal guy. But with the, ba- with the belt, he, he's the superhero, right? He, he's, he carries, <laughs> I always get his shark, anti-shark spray uh, in his belt, if you've seen the old movie. Um, but without the belt, he, he's just a regular Joe, right? But with the belt, he, he's Batman, and that's kind of what Paul's saying. Without the truth, we're, we're nothing. But with the truth, guys, it enables us to do some, some great things through who Christ is, right? It, it makes a difference in our lives. This belt was, was thick. It went around your, your waist. Think of like the, the WCW or the wrestling. You know, they got the, uh, you know, it's bigger than the cowboy belt. It's, it's thick, right? And so it, it would cover your, your groin area and also your intestinal area. And so you, you think about that and, and kind of um, it's an important area, not only because of, uh, you know, these are reproductive organs that it's protecting, um, but it, it's also in those days the, your intestines, um, you know, today we say, I love you with, with all my heart. Um, back then it would be, hey, Amanda. I love you with all my bowels, baby. I mean, don't have as quite as a romantic ring to it, right? But, but that's how it, it was the seat of emotions. It was the seat of emotions. And, and Paul is saying the truth is, is foundational. It, it, it's vital. It covers and protects. And, and it needs to cover our emotions, and there are a lot of people today in our society, sometimes I need to hear this, but there are a lot of people in our society that need to hear that. Guys, we, we don't operate based on our emotions and our feelings. We operate based on God's truth, His Word, what He has said about reality. We don't define reality for ourselves based on how we feel. We look at the One who created reality and He has said, this is the way things are. This is the way to happiness and joy and and life. And we look at that and say, okay, you you have to know better than I do because you created it all. You're the architect. No one would would talk to someone who had designed a a car or an engine or a a computer or or something that is is very mechanical or electrical and someone that's an architect. Uh, if you're working on that and you have a problem with it that you can't figure out, you, you probably would respect the opinion of the person that made it, that drew up the blueprint, that put it all together. You're not going to say, ah, their, their word does not matter. Their opinion doesn't matter. I, I can figure this out on my own. No, you'll break it. You'll destroy it. And that's what we see happening in the garden. It's Adam and Eve said, we can do this on our own. And they broke it. The fall happened. And we're still walking around with this attitude that I can do this without God's input. I don't have to listen to His instructions. I don't have to follow the schematic that He has given us in His Word. And it leads to heartache and pain, problems in our lives. The devil doesn't want us to see God's Word is truth. He wants to give us a counterfeit. Our feelings can get us into trouble, guys. You know this. Our feelings can lead us to act rashly, to act foolishly. Our feelings can cause us to to overreact. Sometimes our our feelings are are going to be at odds with what God says. I, I, I don't want to wait to love them. I want this now. 
How could something that feels so good be wrong? Listen to God. It's going to create obstacles. It's going to create problems. I don't want to be kind. I can't stand that person. I I, I want to knock their teeth out. Don't do it. Listen to God's Word. Listen to His instructions and how you should be loving those people and serving those people. Because that's why we, before we act, we, we, we need to think. We need to, as Natalie said Wednesday, we need to process. Hold on a minute, i got to process. Um, that was good, Natalie. Um, we need to think, what, what is guiding me? What's motivating what I'm about to do? The next piece that Paul mentions is the breastplate of righteousness. And you might ask, and and people have asked, um, is this Christ's righteousness, imputed righteousness, we would call that, or, or is this my righteousness? Is this works righteousness, the things that I do? And I think Paul has both of those in mind, and I'll tell you why. It has to do with being connected to, to truth, right? It, it's connected. First, we, we must be covered in the righteousness of Christ. There's, there's no other way for men to be saved, right? There's no other way for us to, to be restored to a relationship with God, a right standing with God. Um, again, going back to Genesis, just like God sacrificed an animal after Adam and Eve sinned to, to cover up their nakedness, their shame, God sent Jesus, His Son, to be a a sacrifice to to clothe us in righteousness. Jesus was perfectly obedient to the Father. He he lived the life that we could not live, and He he died the death that we deserve. And we must be clothed in Christ's righteousness. That's the gospel. That's the, the truth of the Bible. That's that message, right? But second, this has to do with our, our own righteous acts. Because... The more we are connected to God's truth, the more of an impact it's going to have on our lives. It's going to impact you. It, it, it has to. Because God's Word does not return void. So if we're connected to the truth, it, it's going to shape and influence us. And then Paul has just told us to, to be filled with the Spirit so we can respond and relate in certain ways that would bring glory and honor to God, to be filled with the Spirit who uh, we know is our our teacher who brings to remembrance all things. And I have a little bit longer, um, but I I didn't put this in my notes, But so bear with me, the numbers may not be exact. Um, But I I saw a study from Barna uh, a couple weeks ago, and... Um, it, it said, it was talking about biblical literis, uh, literacy and biblical exposure um, and what an impact that, that makes on people's lives. And so in this study, they surveyed, I think it was uh, 400,000 people. And they asked them some questions about how often they uh, spent time in God's Word. And, and what they found was uh, pretty amazing. They said that people who are in God's Word, who are reading, um, who have exposure to God's Word uh, one time a week, it doesn't really make a difference in their life. If they're exposed to God's Word two times a week, it really doesn't make much difference in their life. Three times a week, it really didn't make a whole lot of difference. But four times a week, when you were in the Word... Four times a week, the changes in your life went up dramatically. Um, they said that those that reported being uh, in the Word four times a week, besides those that either weren't in it or were, were in it less, um, they had about 35% less depression. They had about 35% uh, less problems in their marriage, uh, 35 to 40% fewer marital conflicts. Um, They reported um, being more content with where they were in life financially. 
They reported um, less problems with drug and alcohol abuse, less problems with pornography, um, just being more content where they were in life. And the most amazing part of that um, was there was a a 200% increase in those that were in the Word four times a week sharing the gospel with others. And, And we can see some correlation there. Because if this is real and it matters, then we're going to want to be in the Word because it's not just a hobby. It's not just something we do. It's real and it makes an impact on our lives. And and so we're going to read. We're going to study. We're going to to spend time in prayer because this is not just something that's, that's made up. It's not just a social club that we come to. It actually matters for my life and for your life. And so if it matters for my life and and your life, and we're in the Word, then we'll see that it matters for the lives of other people. And as we see the goodness of God, we're going to want to share that with other people. And say, listen, you know, I I was reading my Bible this week, and God showed me something about life. He showed me um, something about how to to be happy, trusting Him, and be able to speak to other people and, and the problems they're having. It's because of exposure to God's Word putting that breastplate of righteousness on the righteousness of Christ, we have His righteousness and and we begin to image Him. And our actions become righteous actions because we're, we're following our King. Next, Paul says, we need to prepare our feet. Uh, if you remember when Michael Jordan was really big in basketball and um, Nike had the, the it's got to be the shoes kind of commercial. Um, for the Roman soldiers, it, it really was the shoes. Um, their their advancements in, in footwear, I know that kind of sounds weird to us, but yeah, their advancements in, in footwear is where part of their military power came from. A lot of their strength was found in their footwear. And, and we've, you know, we, we've seen that um, even in, Wars that the, the United States has been involved in and the importance of, of keeping your feet uh, protected, keeping your feet dry, um, and, and, and not letting um, infection and, and those kind of things um, set into our, our feet. Um, but the, the, the Roman shoes had thick leather soles um, so they could handle rough terrain. And, and it was a, a common tactic in battles during these days to uh, bury kind of spikes into the ground. Not like the spot pits that you're thinking of people falling into, but just smaller spikes. And so as the enemy would be marching through the field, if, if they didn't have those thick soles on their feet, the spike would go up through the, the sole of the footwear that they had and into their foot. And if you've ever stepped on a nail, you, you know that's not fun. Um, it, it can be devastating. And so the idea was as the the soldiers would march through these fields, if they planted these spikes, um, now you've crippled your enemy, and so they can't advance and they can't retreat. They're they're immobilized, right? And so now they're just waiting for you to to come and slaughter them. Guys, we we don't want to be uh, immobilized. We don't want to be stationary. The Greek word for prepare here, is a, a call to action. It has to do with, with movement. Before a, a dignitary would come into town, um, during those days you would actually have a, a time of preparation. And so when you heard uh, the king or the governor was, was coming into town, um, the townspeople would uh, say, okay, we need to, to prepare our town for them coming to visit us. And so it's time to, you know, you need to pull your weeds uh, we need to mow the lawn. We, we need to, to paint the house, pick up the, the litter, uh, make things nice to receive the king. As Christians, our lives should not be stagnant. Our lives should be lives of action, of preparation, preparing for the king's return. How are we doing on preparing for the arrival of our king? As the Word instructs us, as the Spirit convicts us, how are we responding? What areas of our lives is is God saying, hey, the King is coming. We need to be pulling some weeds. A good example of what can happen if we aren't moving 
Um, we, we can find that in the Old Testament in, in 2 Samuel uh, around chapter 11 uh, where we see and, and read about a time where Israel is at war and King David, rather than going out and fighting with Israel's army as would have been customary at the time, he says, you guys take care of that. I'm going to stay back and, and hang at the house. And as he's hanging back at the house, he gets idle. He gets bored. He goes up to the, the top of the house and basically he starts viewing pornography. He sees Bathsheba up there on her roof. And sin starts to, to creep in and escalate and, and, and snowball. So now he's not just lusting with his eyes. He, he brings her to him. And so now he has a lie that he has to cover up. He has a, a, fault, uh, a failed cover-up attempt. And so now he has to plot, scheme, and, and plan a murder. And all of this, it, it doesn't destroy David. Um, he does repent later. But it, it does sidetrack him. It does derail him for a while. All of that started because he, he was idle. Paul says we need to have our feet prepared with the gospel of peace. We need to be moving toward action, not, not just the, the process of, of sanctification in our lives, but also to, to be uh, engaged in evangelism and, and sharing the gospel with other people. But Paul says don't, don't be idle in your own spiritual life. Don't lose your, your footing. Don't lose your foothold. And, and if you're a hunter, you, you know the danger of, of being idle because that's the opportunity. If you're a hunter, that's the opportunity you're waiting for, right? You're sitting in the deer blind in the stand and, and you're waiting for that big buck to, to be still so you can line up the shot to the, the vital organs. You wait for that moment to, to, to strike. That's what Satan does. If we're not digging, if we're not connecting, if we're not moving forward, then we're vulnerable. Paul says the, the fourth thing that we need is a, a shield. He talks about the shield of faith. Roman shields were uh, four feet tall. Uh, they were wooden shields that would be covered with uh, leather that they would dip into water. And so when the enemy would um, set arrows on fire with, with pitch and tar and, and shoot those, uh, and they went into the shield, the water from the leather would help put those arrows out um, and another interesting thing about those shields is uh, if you had uh, a Roman shield, if I had one and I was holding it here, you know, it's four feet tall, and it's kind of off-center from the person. And so it would protect this area very well, and it would be shorter over here. So it's kind of off-center from me. But what this would allow me to do is if I had a shield and, and Keith had a shield, Keith could come up beside of me and we could put our shields together. And, and you've seen this in movies you, you form a shield wall. You form like this, uh, they call it a, a tortoise formation. And so you, you've got your shields and you're, you're, you're stronger together because those shields can interlock. So Paul says we, we need this shield of faith. And it's a, another illustration of why church family church community is so important. It's why online streaming is convenient, but it's, it's not a replacement for us meeting together, for us being involved in each other's lives. And, and we've talked about this before. If we just meet here on Sunday mornings, that's beneficial, but we're also supposed to, to meet together throughout the week and hopefully you have relationships with each other and some of you do some of that. Have conversations. Meet with one another because um, God's Word says we're not to forsake the assembling together of our, ourselves, of the body. And if you, if you think about it, guys, it's really hard to do all those one another's alone. You can't. You can't. That's why we have to meet so we can Love one another. Speak to one another. Be with one another. These shields could put out the fiery darts, the arrows of the enemy. 
And those darts can be um, thoughts. Those, those darts could be uh, doubts or sinful desires, lustful thoughts. Um, if you've ever had those thoughts that seem to uh, pop up out of nowhere, those darts can be put out by, by faith. By faith in who Jesus is and God's promises that we find in His Word and, and Jesus' work for our, our lives and, and God's truth. Having faith puts out those fiery darts. And then the last piece of armor that, that Paul says we should take up is the helmet of salvation. And, and really this is complementary to uh, the breastplate of, of righteousness because, again, cr- Christianity involves our, our minds. It's not just feelings and uh, emotions. We aren't saved by emotions. We're saved by truth. We're saved by facts. It's not about saying a, a prayer so you can temporarily uh, feel a little bit better about your, your life and try to get some relief from some of those guilt feelings that you may carry around. You have real guilt. And the only way that can be taken care of is by trusting in what Jesus has done in His death, burial, and resurrection. It's about being convinced that Jesus is who He said He is. It's about putting yourself under the, the weight of that reality. Of saying, yes, Jesus is who He says He is, and that bears weight in my life. And then finally, we, we get a weapon, right? Now we, get, we come to the, the good part. We get a weapon. Um, well, kind of. Paul says, take the sword of the Spirit. It's the Spirit's sword. It's God's Word. And it, uh, it reminds me of, of Lord of the Rings. I, I don't know if many of you are Lord of the Rings fans, but there's a, a moment when they're gathered around the table and they're about to, to start on their journey. And um, one says, you have my sword. Another says, you have my axe and you have my bow. And, and uh, as Christians, the, God says, you, you have uh, my sword. And, and so uh, the Roman sword was 18 inches long. Um, it was used for uh, quick jabs. Um, it was used to attack and defend. And it's interesting here that um, Paul doesn't use the, the word logos for the word. He uses the word uh, rima. And the idea behind rima, what, what rima is... Um, articulating is, is that it's, it's literally a uh, specific word. It's a word that is fitting for the occasion at hand. It, it's, it's using the right word at the right time. That's what Paul is getting at here. And so uh, there is a time to uh, be on guard, but there's, a, there's a, also a time to, to be uh, prepared to attack. Again, n- not the person they aren't the enemy, but to attack the, the lie and deception that they have been given. And so uh, emphasize again, this is the sword of the Spirit. It, it's not my job, and it's not your job to play the Holy Spirit. We, we can't do that. All we can do is, is present the truth to people with grace and in love, um, nothing but the facts. We present that, and then it's the Spirit's job to convict, to open hearts and eyes, to, to bring change to a person's life. And that's why Paul says, take up the sword and, and wield it in prayer, right? Wield it in prayer. Recognize, be, be prayerful, mindful of, should I be defending right now? Is there a threat that I need to be defending um, myself from? Is there a threat that I need to be attacking God, help me to, to recognize those opportunities. Help me to see weak uh, links in my armor. Help me to see openings where I'm vulnerable. And then help me to um, attack the enemy and the lies that he is spreading. But also, Father, help me as I attack the enemy and his lies. Help those who are captive. Help them see that. Give them freedom. Open their eyes. So I'm almost... Uh, finished here, but I, I did want to end by, by showing you that it's really cool, guys. It, it really is like the, the Lord of the Rings. He, he did an awesome job, um, you know, kind of bringing this, I think, in. God has given us His armor. Isaiah 59, uh, we 
look at that passage and, and Isaiah is this the prophet who is weeping because of all of the evil, all of the wickedness that he sees around him and the injustice around him in the world and he's praying to God and, and God basically says, listen, I'm taking notice and you need to know that I haven't abandoned you. I haven't forgotten you. I'm going to act. And so we read in Isaiah 59, the Lord saw it, the, the evil and injustice in the world, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. And then his own arm brought him salvation and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, so he will repay wrath to his adver adversaries, repayment to his enemies, to the coastlands he will render repayment. So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising sun, for he will come like a rushing stream which the wind of the Lord drives, and a Redeemer will come to Zion to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares the Lord. So we read in Isaiah that God has looked down on all humanity, at all of our sinfulness, at all of our evil deeds, and He said there, there's no man to intercede. There's no one that can help them. Adam couldn't do it. Adam failed. Abraham failed. Moses failed. David failed. Solomon failed. So God rolled up His sleeves. He put on His breastplate and His helmet and said, I'll, I'll go defeat the enemy. He takes up his sword. He's, he's ready for vengeance. It's time to repay the enemy. And what happens? Instead of, of coming to kill, he, he comes to die. Jesus came to die for our sin. And yes, wrath was poured out and someone paid the price, but it was God Himself that took our penalty. He died so that we could be forgiven, so that we could have victory. So in our, our Christian walk, God says, here, take my helmet, take my breastplate, take my shoes, take my belt, and take my sword, and stand. God has given Himself fully to us. And the question we need to ask ourselves this morning is, is have, I, have I received that? He's offered Himself to us as a, a, a gift to be enjoyed. Have we received that? This is how Paul ends his letter. And we read his closing words to his friends. And he says, you know, guys, I, I'm writing this and I'll send Tychicus and I just want you guys to know that I'm okay even though I'm, I'm in prison, even though I'm facing persecution, I'm at, I'm at peace. And, and may the peace of God be with you. Even though the world is crazy. Even though we don't know what tomorrow may bring. We, we know how the story ends. Paul is saying, stand firm in that. It, it may come to scorched earth around us one day, but stand firm in who... Jesus is and what God has, has given us through His Son. Let's pray. Father, we love You. We thank You for Your Word and, and how it changes our lives, how it gives us new eyes to see, new ears to hear. God, how it shapes us, how it changes relationships with those around us. God, we just ask that You would continue to let us know more and more about who you are and give us understanding of all the riches that we have received from you. God, help us to, to stand. Help us to, to recognize who our real enemy is. Give us wisdom in how we um, engage the culture around us that is in darkness. Help us to do that in a loving way. Help us to, to point them to, to Jesus. Help us not to, to be self-righteous, to be arrogant. 
Let us have the humility of Christ who, who came to serve, to give his life. God, we uh, ask that you'll be with our, our mission partners. Thank you for what you're doing in their, their lives and where they're at and their progress. The news that we have been receiving from them through emails and their updates. God, we, we rejoice with them. But we also lift them up where they're, they're having trouble. Um, in those areas where they, they need help, where they need a, a special touch from you, we just ask that you would move in their midst, that you would protect their families, that you would continue to, to be with them as they build relationships with people who have never heard about you, have never read your word. God, that they would be a, a lot for you. God, we love you. Be with us this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys have a good week.